the ULCCS, as you know, began as part of the anti-caste movement nine decades ago and has, against all odds, not only survived, but actually thrived. Its very existence is an act of heroic assertion of what is possible. Documenting the saga of ULCCS, which is what Comrade Thomas Isaac and Michelle Williams have done, is a remarkable job, essential. I would like to congratulate them, and I also like to congratulate Leftward Books for actually bringing out uh, this volume. This book, however, is not only a discussion of the story of ULCCS, but it also raises very deep theoretical issues. In fact, its very title is suggestive of the theoretical issues it raises. That is, the is it a possible alternative? Can cooperatives be a possible alternative to capitalist enterprises? As a matter of fact, in the preface, which is titled Possible Communism, that actually, is it the case that within the cooperative movement we actually have the embryo of a communist society. Can cooperatives, for instance, if they get generalized across society as a whole, give rise to a society which we call a communist society? And there's a wonderful quotation from Marx on this question in the preface itself. One obvious answer which would be given to this and commonly given is that no, it is not possible because within the cooperative itself, over a period of time, you would have the development of internal contradictions because of which there would be schisms developing within the cooperative entity, cooperative enterprise, cooperative movement itself. As a result, it would tend to reproduce within itself the kind of contradictions that we find within a capitalist society. Now, this book is a resounding proof of the fact that that is not necessarily true. As a matter of fact, one of the main conclusions of the book is that this view that the cooperative movement necessarily develops contradictions within itself that tend to polarize it is a view that does not hold for ULCCS and there's no reason why this view should hold generally. There is, however, a second point which needs to be made here that suppose that capitalism is not only private ownership of the means of production. Suppose we actually had a society in which all entities were cooperatively owned or all entities were actually owned by the state on behalf of society but managed by cooperatives that still would not make it a socialist society that would still reproduce a number of features of capitalism as indeed Yugoslavia did. Capitalism is not only the private ownership of the means of production, but capitalism is also commodity production. Commodity production necessarily fragments people, necessarily fragments the working class. I'd like to recall an incident here in the late 1970s after the emergency when George Fernandez, as you know, he was a leading figure in the anti-emergency struggle. He was a leading trade unionist of the time, General Secretary of the All India Railwaymen's Federation, who took, uh, played a major role in the uh, historic railway strike, became the industry minister in the Janata government. Being the new industry minister, he thought he should do something as far as the working class is concerned. So he proposed workers' participation in management of enterprises to be generalized as, as, as a rule to be, to be kind of applied across the country. And then this idea was presented to the various trade unions and to Fernandez's great surprise, Comrade B.T. Ranandi, who was the president of the CEU, CITU, rejected it outright. He said nothing to it because he said that workers' participation in management 
in a capitalist setting where necessarily enterprises are fragmented and, and, and where commodity production prevails actually forecloses the possibility of class unity of the working class. And as a result, he completely uh, kind of you know, vetoed it. And of course, Fernandez was very surprised. So there is a problem about looking into the cooperative movement as such in the context of an otherwise developing socialist state, in the context of a socialist state that's coming into being, looking at the cooperative movement itself within a world of commodity production as in some sense transcending capitalism is actually an incorrect idea. But then, does it mean that there is nothing about cooperatives? It is. Oh dear, I'm very sorry. I mean, you know, it is it is certainly true that the cooperatives can actually have a democratic structure within themselves, but to the extent that they relate to one another in a world of commodity production, they actually tend to fragment the working class, and as a result, they do not necessarily capture the essence of socialism. It's at best a syndicalist move, not a socialist move. But then but then, does this mean that actually cooperatives do not represent a forward march? Most certainly not. They do represent a forward march in a way which is brought out very well in the book. They represent a forward march, if I can put it in terms of language which I would like to use, in the sense that they represent a bulwark against primitive accumulation of capital. What we witness today in societies like ours is capitalist production supplanting petty production, assaulting petty production, squeezing petty production, displacing petty producers, be they peasants, be they fishermen, be they craftsmen, and so on. Now, of course, if they are to remain viable, in the short run, the state must come to their rescue. But if they are going to remain viable over a longer period of time, then they must be able to obtain the economies of scale. They must be able to obtain the, introduce the kind of technological changes which are necessary for them to be viable. And this is possible within the context of a cooperative framework. If you, for instance, have harvester combines being introduced in the context of capitalist farming, then they displace laborers. But if you have harvesters combined being introduced with laborers, cooperatives owning those combines, then what the laborers lose by way of wage income, they make up by way of profit income. And what is more, while their incomes don't suffer, they actually have greater leisure. So the cooperative movement has an enormous role to play as a bulwark against the process of primitive accumulation of capital. And this is something which can even take the form where cooperatives can even be involved in the process of investment, in which case the kind of displacement of peasants and so on that we see all across the world, including in China and certainly in India, is some the, its effects could be minimized, negated, obviated, if you have, for instance, peasants cooperatives themselves setting up industrial projects. This is why the fact that cooperatives can represent in the context of a development of, of, of socialism, they can represent a transition from petty production to higher forms like a socialist society is something which actually makes capitalism quite strongly opposed to cooperatives. There are at least two very obvious reasons for it. One is that cooperatives are a way in which petty production can survive, can prevent primitive accumulation of capital. This animosity was very clear, for instance, in the wake of demonetization. Demonetization not only dealt a heavy blow against the petty production sector, but demonetization, as Comrade Isaac wrote at that time, was actually a big blow against the cooperative movement in Kerala, which is a state with a very developed cooperative movement. In fact, one of the major differences between Bengal and Kerala, and this has implications for the divergent fortunes of the left movement in the two states, is that in Bengal, the cooperative movement is virtually non-existent, while in Kerala, the cooperative movement is extremely powerful. 
There's a second reason, namely that you know that 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 it is important for capitalism to prove that you cannot do without capitalist property. If you can have a society in which property can be organized along different lines, then that is something that represents an existential threat in a conceptual sense to capitalism. And therefore, they are always opposed to the public sector, for instance, vilifying the public sector day in and day out. And likewise, they're also opposed to other forms of property, other forms of organization, like cooperatives. Now, issues like these are raised in this book. The quality of an outstanding book is when it makes you think about deep issues, and this is certainly one such book. I'd like to congratulate the authors and the Leftward Books for bringing out this volume. Thank you very much.